Hello students, uh, it's great to see each one of you. Uh, today we are looking at three major theories in international relations. We have talked about some other theories in international relations at the beginning of the semester. Today we are focusing on three major theories that define international relations, the core, the foundation of international relations. These three uh, theories are the hallmark of international relations, so to speak. The first one is realism. And we've touched on this in the course of the semester, but we're going to expand on this a bit more today. So realism has to do with national interest, and every country has national interest. Uh, every country has what they call national interest, and for some it could be defense, it could be security, it could be relations with others, it could be trade. Whatever the case may be, every country has national interest. Realism as a theory is suggesting that National interest drives nation states. Now, what does that mean, students? National interest drives nation states. That means the motivation, please take note of this, the motivation for nation states to take action internationally is based on their national interest. And this is a very important point. Take note of this, students. The motivation for nation states is based on their national interest. So if their national interest is threatened, states take action. Right? If their national interest is threatened, state take, uh, states take action. If their national interest needs to be furthered, uh, they see a need to further their national interest, they take action as well. Two factors motivate states to take action. One is to protect their national interest. Another is to further their national interest. Sometimes both of them work hand in hand as well. In other words, nations are mainly concerned about consolidating their power and influence over others and maintaining their security. Right? So every nation, it doesn't matter how small the nation is, some of them can accomplish this more than the others, depending on their capacity and their abilities and the resources at their disposal. But states are concerned about consolidating power and influence over others, over their neighbors, over those, over those that they do business with, over those they see as rivals. And this is all over the world, not any particular state, not in any particular continent. It's all over the world. So in other words, nations are mainly concerned about consolidating their power and influence over others and maintaining their security, right? So they want to maintain their security. That's their national interest, of course, to maintain security. It's in the national interest of every nation. To influence others is in the national interest of every nation. To further their interest, to uh, get into alliances, treaties, or what have you, to further their interest uh, is in the interest of nation states. That's all they're concerned about. And we see many evidence in the United States, many evidence uh, with the big countries, Russia, US, UK, France, etc. As an example, uh, take note of these students, Russia invaded Ukraine because of what? Because of national interest. Let's highlight this. Because of national interest, take note of this right here. That's why it invaded Ukraine, to protect its national interest, because it was concerned that Ukraine would join the European Union and would be part of NATO, and it wanted to protect its interest. So it was proactive and it invaded Ukraine. Now, of course, that's a violation of international law, but that's another topic. But the reason for the invasion of Ukraine is to protect its national interest. And countries all over the world do that as well. From the United States standpoint, going to war against Iraq was to protect its national interest because it claimed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. On that basis, it went to war. And the idea is Iraq was going to use the weapons of mass destruction against Western interest, against the United States interest. Now, it turned out to be that there were no weapons of mass destruction. But again, that's a topic for another day. So take note of this point. So realism then is about national interest it is the motivating factor for states. It drives states, nation states, towards action to protect their national interest. All right, so let's take a look at this closely. The main thrust of this theory is power and state-to-state -state interactions, right? So when states interact with another state, it does so on basis of power. It, it tries to find out if the other state has advantage over it, and if so, what is the advantage, and so forth. And this happens in every interaction between states and among states. So the main thrust of realism is power and state-to-state -state interaction. And power is at the center of state-to-state -state interaction. Every state-to-state -state interaction. And you see some states are bigger than others, so they influence the other states and try to get them on board and try to see the agenda and try to bring them 
to align with their objectives and so forth because they have power because they have power right so it further says it looks at international politics and relations as a struggle for power among states that is realism realism is all about power among states states looking for power to influence the others states looking for power right to, to ensure that they have hegemony and hegemony is about control uh, and that's why perpetually the big states the united states france uh, russia uh, uk can get away with a lot of things that other states can get away with right because they have power they have resources they have capacity they have ability and they can get away with a lot of things they can ignore court orders international uh, court of justice orders right and not fear any repercussions because they have power so realism suggests that national interest drives the actions of nation state please take note of the students it's a very critical point take note of this national interest drives states actions the actions of states are based on their national interest when states go to war it's because they want to protect their national interest when states uh, get into an alliance with another because they want to protect their national interest when states threaten other states they are protecting their national interest and that's the concept and that's the theory of realism the other theory is liberalism and this theory is one of the most influential in international relations as it deals with values such as individual rights freedoms and democracy it deals with values such as individual rights freedoms and democracy and this is important to states because they want to protect the rights of their citizens and if any other states come into their space to violate the rights of the citizens, they react accordingly. And sometimes that reaction could be diplomatic, political, it could be military, it could be economic. But nevertheless, they react to protect the individual rights of their citizens. So liberalism is one of the most influential international relations theory. Please take note of the students because we want to understand what liberalism is and the interplay of this whole theory among nation states, right? So it deals with values such as individual rights. Now, what are individual rights? Rights to education, for example, right to health, for example, right to work, for example, right to shelter, for example, and many more rights, freedom of speech. So these are rights that individuals have in any, you know, democratic country, and those rights must be respected and if they are violated, there's going to be a redress, uh, either legal redress or other types of redress. So freedoms, right? Freedom to, to be elected, freedom to vote, right? Those are all freedoms that you know, people in Western countries take for granted and have and are protected by the Constitution, as well as democracy, the opportunity for the citizens to choose their leaders. This is not the case in many other countries out there. Leaders impose themselves on their population, on their citizens, and their citizens don't have a way to push back, essentially. But the theory of liberalism is suggesting that, well, these have to be protected. These are fundamental rights of citizens. It is primarily concerned with how states can work collaboratively to bring about peace on the global level, understanding and economic opportunities for all individuals in the world. That is liberalism primarily concerned with individual rights. It's at an individual level. The realism is on the, um, it's on the national level and on the international level as well. Liberalism is within the country on the individual level, ensuring individual rights and freedoms and ensuring democracy reigns and the ethos of democracy are protected and that the people have the right to elect their leaders. It is primarily concerned with how states can work collaboratively right so even though it's primarily within the borders of a country we talk about individual rights and freedom as well as democracy it does have an international component to it please take note of the students it does have an international component to it and that international component is to ensure that people around the world citizens around the world uh it doesn't have to be in a particular country but around the world have the opportunity for economic progress have economic opportunities and live in a peaceful world that is the theory of liberalism in international relations and now let's move to the final point here which is marxism and again i know we discussed marxism at the beginning of the semester we're going to take a look at it a bit closely and we're going to finish up down the road about this whole idea of marxism 
Marxism is a philosophy of thought. What does that mean, philosophy of thought, right? It's a philosophy of thought, an ideology that believes that class struggle and capitalism creates the environment for conflict. But this is very interesting. How does it do it? How does capitalism, as a system of government that allows for free market economy, that allows for innovation and creativity, that allows for business competition, how does that create conflict in society? Now, take note of these students, and I would like you to think about this a little bit deeper. How does capitalism lead to conflict? How does it uh, create an environment where conflict can foster? Take a look at that. So this is a very important question that is asked about this whole idea of Marxism and the idea of capitalism as well. So Marxism believes that capitalism creates economic inequality. Economic inequality. Now, how does that happen? How does it create economic inequality? Well, Marxists will say, because not all people in society have the same abilities. Some are smarter than the others. Some are more resourceful than the others. Some have better insights than the others. Some have more business sense than the others. And if you have a business sense, you are more likely to make money, while others without business sense may not make the kind of money that you're making. That's the inequality they're talking about, right? Because not everyone in society has the same ability. It's not possible, not in any society. And that's why you have plumbers, you have doctors, you have athletes, uh, and athletes cannot be plumbers, and plumbers cannot be athletes. You have doctors, they cannot be engineers, and so forth. Everybody has different capabilities, and different skills, and different interests, and so forth. And that creates inequality, because the doctor is more valued than the plumber. And the athlete is more valued than the teacher, right? And that's the inequality Marxism is talking about. So Marxism or Marxists believe that capitalism creates economic inequality with this philosophy of competition for scarce resources, right? And that causes clash in society. So it is suggesting that the citizens are competing for scarce resources. And if there's scarce resources in society, well, there's going to be fights. Right? There's going to be um, there's going to be tension and stress and, and what have you, because there's not enough to go around. You just look at the situation where there's let's say there are twenty people in a room, and you have only five chairs, and they all have to sit down. They will fight for those five chairs, right? And the most powerful will be the one sitting down at the end of the fight. That's how society is. Very scarce resources. Many people pursue those resources. And as a result of that, there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be fights, there's going to be stress, there's going to be anxiety, there's going to be many concerns. That is Marxism as a theory in international relations. So let's cap this up before we move on to the next item. So realism is the theory that national interest drives nation state to action. Please take note of that. And every nation state has national interest. Now, I'd like you guys to jot down some of the national interests of this country. Uh, we have national interest will be democracy, of course, to promote democracy amongst our neighbors. Another national interest is to ensure that the economy is strong and GDP rates are very high uh, and what have you. That's national interest because when your economy is strong, you're respected around the world, you're invited to the table, you're part of the elite class. That is national interest. Building up the military and making sure the military is equipped. That's national interest as well. So these interests drive nation states to take action. Nations are mainly concerned about consolidating their power and influence over others and maintaining their security. And once again, the main thrust of this theory, please take note of this, and this is the important point here, and this is the key point here, that the theory is power and state-to-state -state interaction. It has to do with power. And if you don't learn anything today, learn this, every interaction amongst and between states is based on power. Every single interaction amongst and between states is based on power. They are sizing each other up, they are trying to figure out their advantage over the others, and they are trying to ensure that they have hegemony over the others. It looks at international politics and relations as a struggle for power among states. That's realism, students. Liberalism, as we said moments ago, deals with Individual rights is one of the most influential theories in international relations because it deals with individual rights and freedoms. It deals with democracy, the right for the people to choose their leaders. 
Its primary concern with how states can work collaboratively to bring about peace, understanding, and economic opportunities for all individuals. So even though mainly individual rights, even though mainly individual rights students are within the space, uh, within the border of a country, right? There is opportunity for countries under this theory to interact and ensure that they have collective individual rights. For example, European Union. Uh, and ensure that the citizens of the European Union, the citizens of European countries have equal rights and have uh, individual rights protected. Same thing with ECOWAS in Africa and West Africa, ensuring that citizens have economic uh, prosperity and economic opportunities. They are able to cross into each other's country without much barriers to make sure that they have those opportunities for collaborative existence. That is liberalism. And finally, once again, Marxism is a theory that believes that class struggle and capitalism creates the environment for conflict. And how does it do it? Because so many people are chasing scarce resources. And I give an example of the five chairs and 20 people in the room. And this is Marxism. These three theories are key underpinning of international relations. Please take note of the students. These three theories are key underpinnings of international relations. And for you to understand international relations, you must have a good grasp of these theories, in addition to the ones we discussed earlier. But these are very prominent theories in international relations. And every interaction amongst and between countries hinges on one of these theories, if not more. All right, so we're going to end it here. We're going to take a look at additional information in the next uh, segment.